Now, the last session, we talked about the geologic column and that it's found only in one place in the world in your textbooks. We looked at dating methods, the problems with the dating methods, that they don't work. And we looked at circular reasoning, actually, maybe it's like that, huh? And then we looked at uh, index fossils and how some of them are still around, so that doesn't work. And we looked how fossils form, that they can fo uh, form rapidly. We looked at a couple different kinds of rocks, and then we found a new kind of rock, the Genesis rock. Because of polonium halos, they had to form instantaneously. God spoke, and it stood still. Now, how many of you have heard of a meteorite that struck and destroyed all the dinosaurs? Yeah, we've all heard that story. You know, it's funny because that is a catastrophe. It's just not quite the right one. Just thought I'd throw that in. Anyway, this is a diatom. It's really small. It's about two millimeters. That's about a tenth of the thickness of a nickel. And it's, uh, the cell wall is of silica. And they have a number of uh, pretty shapes. It you know, kind of reminds me of snowflakes. And it's said that it would take about a thousand years for one inch of diatoms to build up on the ocean floor. Now, we've got uh, a thing called diatomaceous earth that is made up of these diatoms. And it has many uses. Uh, it says detergent, insulation, soundproofing, uh, insecticides. It actually scratches the surface of the bugs. Uh, I guess that's why it could be used for a polish or for removing paint. Anyway, uh, fairly near here in uh, Lompoc, California, is the largest diatomaceous quarry in the world. Now, when they were digging, they were uh, discovered a fossil skeleton of a baleen whale in amongst the diatoms. Now, when they found it, it was standing on its tail. Now, picture this. It takes a thousand years for an inch to stack up. And he looks, I don't know, 40 feet long? That's uh, half a billion years. So maybe this was a disaster. How about that? How about a flood? They also found uh, whales, dolphins, trillions of fish, and even a pterodactyl, and, you know, they fly. So that's uh, kind of interesting that all that was found together because things tend to get sorted when they are in a flood, and you tend to get concentrations of things you wouldn't normally get. And here's a chunk of diatomation uh, earth, and you can see some of the fossils in, on the side of this chunk of rock. Now, there's also, if you go over to England, they have these white cliffs over there, the white cliffs of Dover. Uh, they're, they're, they're made of chalk. You could probably break a chunk off and go to a whiteboard. No, the wrong kind of board. Blackboard. It's got to be a blackboard, right? And write on it. Nobody knows what a blackboard is anymore, so I don't know if this works. Uh, but anyway, uh, there was so much of this stuff found uh, that they called it the Cretaceous Age. See, cre creta in Latin is Latin for chalk. Now, chalk comes from the skeletal remains of the platonic green algae. So you had to have a lot of it at once to get it to stack up like this. Now, in Genesis, we talk about the flood a bit. It says here in Genesis 7, 18, and the waters prevailed. I guess the waters won. The waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. You know, we find, I showed you uh, some fossils that were found. They had to be covered rapidly to keep them from being disarticulated. But we also find places where they're all scattered up and jumbled together, pieces, parts, and such. Well, here, I, uh, in 1934, Barnum Brown, a famous dinosaur discoverer, on a ranch owned by Baker Howe in the Bighorn Mountains of Wyoming, and he said this, the concentration of fossils was remarkable. They were piled like logs in a jam. Now, it's interesting he should use a representation like that because logs in a log jam is a representation of water. Logs floating on water get in a log jam, and it looked like, gee, a log jam. And here's a, a picture of the fossils all jammed together. 
Now, evolution has some predictions about the, uh, what we should find in the fossils. Basically, uh, they, they predict that starting from rocks, you get single cell, then multi cell, then uh, invertebrates, then vertebrates, and all, on up, more complex. So, two things larger and more complex. That's, that's the prediction of evolution. Somebody's an evolution guy says, oh no, it doesn't predict that, it's just whatever's most favored. Well, you can't start with a bird until you've started with a single cell, right? So it's got to get bigger. Okay, well, anyway. Uh, so let's look at a few things and the sizes in the past. Gee, they were bigger. Here we have a penguin about five and a half feet tall. That's not so much taller. We have a spider with a body that's about a foot long. I don't really want to see that spider, and I'm not, not all that afraid of spiders, but I still don't want to see that guy. Here's a hyrax. The uh, one below is about two foot is a uh, modern hyrax. The big one, the five foot long one, is what we find in the fossil record. Here's a, a, a no-horned rhinoceros that was about 18 feet on its back. And this bird here uh, looks a lot like an eagle. It had uh, roughly a 22-foot wingspan. Now that bird would probably be something you'd want to watch out for. <laughs> this uh, little guy up in the right-hand corner, that's a modern tree sloth. The uh, big guy, he's a, a ground sloth, and he's about 20 feet tall. We have some more. We have a turtle, a 12-foot turtle. That's a big turtle. Now, it's actually interesting. You look at the names, you know, the modern ones have like turtle, and the old ones have like, you know, uh, let's see, what's it called? Um, a oh, Euripidus, or, you know, they, they have all these different names that are more uh, Greek, but it's, it's roughly the same critters in many cases. Here we have a, uh, a lobster that's eight foot long. We have a bear that's when it's walking on all fours, is nine feet tall. When he stands up, he's 20 feet tall. That's a big bear. Big bear. Now, uh, in Arkansas, we have uh, some uh, uh, armadillos. We, you know, they used to be in Texas, but they've kind of migrated up into Arkansas now. And I can see them every so often. Usually a car will hit one, and it'll be on the side of the road. But I look at this one, he's seven feet tall. I'm not sure who's going to win. <laughs> they've found uh, dragonflies with a three-foot wingspan, uh, and they've even found some with a five-foot wingspan. Now, I've gotten dragonflies uh, in my grill, hit my windshield. I don't know, this one might go through. But they found larger creatures. Here we have a... Uh, uh, Pterodactyl, it's a P, that S, whatever the letters at the beginning always mess me up. A pterodactyl, and it's got a 30 foot wingspan. We have an alligator that's 48 foot long. Uh, that would be a big alligator. We have a, a shark that's 60 foot long. He'd have jaws for breakfast. Uh, that is a big shark. And then this, this big creature on the bottom with the 30 foot back. He is uh, 120 feet long. He's so big, they call him the Ultrasaurus. It's a little bit like this guy. So, we've got to ask the question, what destroyed the dinosaur? Actually, what destroyed a lot of species? Well, were there dinosaurs in the garden? Were there dinosaurs on the ark? Are there dinosaurs in the Bible? Now, Job is one of the older books in the Bible, but uh, after talking to some uh, elders here, I believe it's, it's pretty clear that it was after the flood that Job lived. And Job wrote some interesting things about some critters he ran into. Here's, but uh, before we get there, Job was having problems, lots of problems. And he kept asking the Lord, Lord, you know, what's up with this? Why am I having all these problems? You know, I, I think I'm following you. And he just kept questioning and questioning, looking for answers. And so 
Finally, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Gird up thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee and answer thou me. That's kind of like man up. Quit complaining. And so then he asked him a series of questions. Now, when God asks a question, he is not asking a question to gain information. He is asking a question to raise your consciousness level. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? That's kind of a, a question that will give you a little perspective. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? As I mentioned in a previous one, we didn't know there were springs in the sea until 1976. Where is the way where light dwelleth? Now, that's a very interesting question. Science has had a lot of controversy recently trying to figure out if light is like a photon, like a particle, or is light like a wave? Because it kind of has attributes of both. And so the Bi Bible describes light as a way. How interesting. By what way is the light parted, which scattereth the east wind upon the earth? Light causing wind? Hmm, you see, light will warm up an area. It will raise the, the air up, and it will cause a low pressure, and the wind will blow in. Light causes wind. And now let's look at an interesting creature that God points Job to. It's called, Behold, Behemoth which I made with thee, I made with thee. That means God made it. He eateth grass as an ox. Okay, let's find out a little more about this behemoth because I've never heard of a behemoth or behemoth. Well, in the center reference, it said it's supposed to be an elephant or a hippopotamus. Well, let's read a little further. Lo, now his strength is in his loins, and the, the force is in the navel of his belly. Well, elephants have a big belly. Hippopotami have a big belly. He has a big belly. He has a big belly. Let's go on. He says, he moved, moveth his tail like a cedar. And the sinew of his stones are wrapped together. Well, let's see. His tail doesn't look like a cedar. His tail doesn't look like a cedar either. His tail looks like a cedar. Hmm. Maybe this is a behemoth. His bones are as strong as pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. Well, this is a brachiosaur toe bone, and they're heavy duty and big. You know, he has a, a big toe bone because he has a big leg. Whoa, went right by it. You know, he's got a, a big leg because he's got a big body. He weighs about 100 tons, which is about 14 school buses. Then there's another creature mentioned in uh, chapter 41, and I actually challenge you to go read chapter 41 about this creature, Leviathan. Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? As later it says, uh, fight with him and remember your battle no more. <laughs> so what is a Leviathan? Well, Sir Richard Owen in 1841 coined the word dinosaur which means terrifying lizard. Before the 1841, there was no word dinosaur. So they used words like dragon or monster. And we have... Uh, uh, oh, that's a, that's a different slide than I expected. Okay. If dinosaurs were really on the ark, where are they? Now, I think there are a few left. And... You don't really have to be afraid to go to the mall. Well, you might be afraid to go there. 
but that there are few still left in remote places. But you see, as the population of humans increase, the population of dangerous and large animals decreases. And these would have been the first guys you want to get rid of. They're so big, you know, they stomp all over your corn, trash your house. Well, there's a number of reasons you might want to kill these guys off. They could be, maybe you'd want to eat them. We wouldn't. Uh, maybe they were a mentis, menace walking on the village. Uh, you want to be a hero, say, you always oh, save the village from the dragon. Prove you're superior. Uh, maybe competition for the land, or some people might even think they're medicinal. Now, there's thousands of <coughs> legends of dragons. We have Gilgamesh slaying the dragon. Here's an old Chinese legend that uh, tells of a famous Chinese man named Wu. After the Great Flood, Yu surveyed the land of China and divided it into sections. He built channels to drain the water off to the sea and helped make the land livable again. Many snakes and dragons were driven from the marshlands. You created new farmlands. Now, when he drove the dragons off, he said snakes. Now, I don't think he's talking about little snakes like this. So we'll look at a little bit about bigger snakes at another time. Now, in Babylon, the chief god of Babylon was Marduk, a dragon. And on the wall, in the reliefs in, in Babylon, they had drawings of lions, a real creature. And they also had drawings of dragons. Hmm. Now, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, there's a controversy, um, probably not an important one, that is about amalgamations. You know, were dinosaurs amalgamations? Well... I look at some of these dinosaur, uh, some of these amalgamations like a mule, it's kind of like a donkey and a horse, or a, a zorse, which is kind of like a zebra and a horse. And even if you go back to the mythical uh, centaur, centaur, the uh, man-horse combination, you could see the man and the horse in the com combination. So I'm kind of wondering, if these are supposed to be amalgamations, what are the amalgamations of? But let's forget that for a moment. I, I'm going to go back to it. First, let's look at the Torah. Because, you know, the Torah is kind of our basis for understanding amalgamations, I believe. And I think we want to go to Leviticus 19.19. 19. Ye shall keep my statutes. Thou shalt not let thy cattle gender with a uh, diverse kind. Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. Neither shall a garment mingled of linen and wool come upon thee. Now, diverse cattle, I think uh, we, we're doing that, and we shouldn't be as people. Uh, mingling seed, I would say it's pretty clear that GMO crops are mingled seed, and it is against the Torah. We should not be eating mingled seed. Now, when a garment comes on you that's, uh, let's say, for instance, you were to wear a linen shirt or top and put a woolen sweater over it. I personally think that would be okay. Maybe some of you don't. Uh, that's all right. But I think it's the mingling of the threads that is the Torah reference here. That's my opinion. Ellen White talks about amalgamations. And I thought this might draw some clarity to the whole discussion of amalgamations. Uh, here's a statement. She said, But if there was one sin above another which called for the destruction of the race by the flood, it was the base crime of amalgamation of man and beast, which defaced the image of God and caused confusion everywhere. Now, I can just see if you had a, a centaur, half man, half horse, is this something that can be saved? That's confusion. That's confusion. It's, it's chaos. Uh, now, she also made another statement about these confused species. The confused species which God did not create 
we're the result of amalgamation. We're destroyed by the flood. So if we see evidence of them after the flood, they were not amalgamations. Now there is the possibility of them amalgamating them later, which of course they're trying to do now. There's some quite disturbing things I have seen in the news recently. Human animal chimera are gestating on U.S. research farms. A radical new approach to generating human organs is to grow them inside pigs or sheep. That's disturbing. And of course they always add unclean. It is even more disturbing. Scientists create bizarre human-animal hybrids. Now, I want you to listen to this first part because it's going to talk about ethics. I don't know, if you don't have the Torah as a basis, here's what you have for ethics. The informal ethics committee at Stanford University endorsed a proposal to create mice with brains nearly completely made of human brain cells. But they want to prevent the mice from creating any traits of humanity. They plan to monitor the mice and immediately kill any that show human-like behavior. Isn't that disturbing? Oh, our answer to doing it is not to this ethics dilemma of, is kill it if it looks a little bit human and starts acting like a human. That's disturbing on several levels. You know, this was the kind of thing that caused the flood. I can tell you for certain, Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Now let's go back to uh, some historical evidence of seeing uh, unusual creatures. Alexander the Great reported when he was conquering parts of what is now India in 326 BC, his soldiers were scared by great dragons that lived in the caves. Here's a Roman mosaic from the second century AD showing two long-necked dragons. Are they fighting or maybe they're necking? <laughs> Saint George in 275 AD was uh, slaying a dragon. We have Beowulf slew a dragon at age 88. I guess the rest of us young kids, we got to get out there and get our dragon. Here's a Babylonian cylinder, a uh, winged dragon. Here's a Russian medallion, ringed dragon. Here's a uh, Bulgarian postage stamp, winged dragon. I guess there's some winged dragons. Here's in uh, 900 AD, an Irish writer told of an animal with iron tails iron nails on its tail, and a head similar to a horse, and thick, strong legs. Kind of sounds like a stegosaurus. Hmm. Here's Siegfried, slayed the dragon Fafner. Marco Polo, when he visited China, he said the, the, the emperor towed his carriage with dragons. This is about uh, 1271 A.D., the town of Nerlu was named in honor of a dragon that was slain there. It had long, sharp, pointed horns on its head. Hmm. Native Americans had pictographs in the Grand Canyon. And if you look close at some of them, this one kind of looks like an Edmontosaurus. Hmm. Up close, there's a wide body, long neck one. I don't know if that was kind of like this. There's a, actually a number of uh, dinosaurs that have a rough shape like this. Uh, Apatosaurus, bra uh, Brachiosaurus, Ultrasaurus. Out in Ica, Peru. Now, Ica, Peru is, one of the is the most arid place in the world. That means dry. And in Ica, Peru, they found, uh, that's the place where if you fly over, you can see all those images in the desert. Well, anyway, they found some funny rocks. Uh, back in 1571, the Spanish conquistadors mentioned that there were stones with strange creatures drawn on the stones. Well, a, a doctor, Darcu, uh, 
started collecting these and putting them in a museum, and now they're a national treasure, and they have pictures of dinosaurs on these rocks. So how did they know what they looked like to draw them if all they saw was fossils? He's got a lot of these. He's been collecting them over years. And uh, here we have a stegosaurus, a triceratops. Here's one with humans interacting with a dinosaur. Hmm. One seems he's got his foot stuck in there. Probably go save his friend. Here's a picture of a triceratops. Now, I, th I thought about this. I thought, well, that's interesting because all we know about is fossils. Maybe this is the best representation or picture of a triceratops we've ever had to know what it actually looks like. Of course, back in uh, 1572, when you go to a museum, you could find a tanistrophus. Not a fossilized Tanistrophus, but a stuffed Tanistrophus. They found a dead one, they stuffed it, and they put it in a museum in, in 1572. They called it a dragon. Now, there was a, a great age of sailing ships when, like here, a Viking ship would put a, a, a monster on the end of its, uh, on the bow. It looks a little bit like uh, this guy's head, maybe. And you see here on, the, on their ship, uh, they've got a, a dinosaur head or, or a sea monster head on the front. I don't know if that would attract them or scare them away. Might not be good. Anyway, between 1500s and 1900s was the great age of sailing ships. Now, sailing ships are unique because they travel through the water almost without sound. And so they reported many sea monsters in this age. Since then, we have these diesel and steam-powered engines that make lots of racket, and water is a good transmitter of sound. You could hear a ship coming for miles underwater. In Greenland, Hans Egedi, uh, a missionary to Greenland, drew this sketch in 1734 of a sea monster. Uh, Bishop Eric Pantapadon in 1755 uh, cited this sea monster. Uh, the HMS Daedalus, the captain Peter Quay, McQuay, spotted a sea monster that was 60 foot long. Now they knew what whales were, they knew this wasn't a whale. In 1850, a whaling ship, Monongahela, went out of New Bedford, Mass. It killed a 103-foot sea monster in the Pacific Ocean. The sailors said it had two blowholes, it had four fins, and an alligator-like head with, many, with 94 very sharp teeth. Now, a passing ship found the Monongahela and came up to it and actually saw the, some of the creature. They were actually... Uh, cutting it up and boiling it down for oil. And they sold some of the sea serpent oil to this crew and said, hey, we're coming back with the sea serpent, uh, but we got to do some more fishing. So they took off and they were never heard from again. Uh, there was a board from the Monongahela showed up in an Aleutian Island. In World War I, a U-boat was sinking a uh, freighter and as the freighter sunk, it blew up. And a large sea monster jumped out of the water. And so the U-boat captain reported seeing this 60-foot-long sea monster. Off of uh, New Zealand, they were doing some fishing out there. And they came across this 32-foot-long creature weighing 4,000 pounds. And they dragged it up from about 900 feet. And that was in 1977. And the head, it was, I'm sorry, it was dead and it was rotting and it stunk. And this is a fishing vessel. So they took pictures of it, measured it, that kind of stuff, and they threw it back. <laughs> they threw it back. If they'd done nothing else and fished none and just went straight back to port, they probably would have made all the money they needed. Anyway... This is uh, another picture of it. 
Now they say, oh, this is a baleen whale and its parts are falling off. Well, there's what a baleen whale looks like. Doesn't much look like that. Now, they had a biologist on board, and he examined it. Unless he's a total lunatic, his drawings are totally inaccurate, because that doesn't look at all like a baleen whale. Baleen whales don't have necks. Looks kind of like a, a plesiosaur with a little shorter neck than this guy. This other picture of it... Uh, Anyway, the, the Japanese were so impressed that they found a plesiosaur that in their 100-year anniversary stamp, they put a picture of a plesiosaur on it because that's what they think they found. Now, in 1907, Lieutenant Colonel Perry Fawcett of the British Army was sent to mark boundaries between Brazil and Peru. Now, he was a member of the Royal Office, uh, Royal Engineers, which are known for meticulous detail. You don't do, you don't make things up in the military. They frown on that. Well, he was in the swamps, about where that era is at, and he saw a creature, and he thought it looked like a diplodocus. It's another creature roughly like these shapes. And they went a little further, and they found the tracks and the trail where it had been. Now this was found uh, last, uh, this month in Florida. This is an 800 pound, 15 foot alligator. Now one thing is funny about uh, snakes and reptiles. As long as they're alive, they continue to grow. That's how I think these guys can get so big is because they they lived a long time, and they kept growing and growing and growing. This alligator was going to keep growing unless these guys went out there and got it. Here's a, here's a big snake. It's about 35 foot long with native inside. Here's a bigger snake, 55 foot snake. It was found in the backyard in China. There was actually uh, there was a security guard. I don't know if he was sleeping at his post, but... He's sleeping now. He's inside that snake. That's not the biggest snake, though. Here's a snake, a uh, 62-foot anaconda that Colonel Peary, uh, P Percy Fawcett uh, encountered. Of course, uh, you see something big, you got to shoot at it. That's not the biggest. Officials of the Columbia of the Brazil Columbia Boundary Commission in 1933 killed a 98 foot snake. It was two feet in diameter, and it was on the Rio Negro. They used a machine gun to kill it. So four men could not lift its head. That's a, that's a big snake, but that's not the biggest snake. Here's a 130-foot-long boa was seen in Peru. It says it was 15 feet in diameter. Oh, my. It was crashing through the jungle, creating a trench as it went. It shook the ground. The villagers, they had five witnesses. The villagers, a ways away, felt the ground shaking. That's a big snake. That's not the biggest snake. Here's a photograph from 1959 in the Congo. This snake is thought to be 200 feet long. They took it from the air. They were going to get closer, but the snake started to rear up like it was going to attack. That was one big snake. And I, you know, I think about some of these folks that look at the evidence and they have trouble understanding what the evidence means. What do you think it symbolizes? Now, there's a, uh, a place uh, in uh, Scotland where they, uh, in 1933, used some dynamite and they created this road along this loch, the Loch Ness. 
And in the first year they built the road, they had 52 sightings of Loch Ness Monster. And they've had over 9,000 sightings. Now, what is this problem with finding a plesiosaur in the loch? You see, there's a couple of different kinds of plesiosaurs. There's the chronosaur type of plesiosaur. There's the elasmosaur. There's the plesiosaur kind of plesiosaur. But uh, others insist Nessie must be a plesiosaur. One thing wrong with this theory is that plesiosaurs are believed to have become extinct 70 million years ago. So, if you believe in evolution, seeing the Loch Ness Monster, of course, could never happen. They must all be crazy. All 90,000 of them. However, if you believe in creation, it's not so unreasonable to have a few of these creatures still around. Arthur Grant, who was a veterinary student, nearly ran Nessie over with his motorcycle one night at 1.30 a.m. This is 1934. That's what he thought it looked like. Here, uh, here oh no, this is his drawing of it. Here the Spicer family reported seeing Nessie with a sheep in its mouth. So evidently it can you know, flop up on the shore and grab things. So you might not want to get too close. Here's uh, Torque McLeod's impression of the monster. You know, they look all about the same, don't they? Well, in 1987, they, they decided they were going to solve this once and for all with Operation Deep Scan. So they put side scan sonar on a number of boats and decided to run it down the length of the Loch Ness. Well, the problem is, is it's all wrinkled up like a raisin, and there's lots of caves in on the sides, so they didn't see it. Now, the Loch Ness is kind of like coffee in consistency. It's hard to see very far in the Loch Ness. But somebody decided what they were going to do is they were going to put a, a camera on a motion detector. And uh, what they found, what they got was these fins. Well, that's really interesting shape. You can see the fins there. Look a lot like, uh, uh oh, one too many. Look a lot like plesiosaur fins. Hmm. Now there's, uh, whoa! <laughs> I went about a hundred places. I'm going to back up a bit. Oh, come on. Okay, I think we are there. Well, there's some other creatures that have been seen in different places around the world. This is a picture from Reader's Digest. This one also came from Russia. There's a lake out there where the ducks don't land on the water. <laughs> the geese. We have a, a huge creature, looked like a dinosaur, washed up on the northern coast of Russia. That was in 1994. It was 39 feet long. We have over in Japan, on the northern island, they have Kussy, kind of named after Nessie. And it's a long black eel-like monster. Then down at the southern part, down at